Bar Council of India had full trust and faith on the leaders of the bar that this two days international lawyers conference will be a grand success because of your active cooperation and your active help. So, now this is your help. कि सेशंस को हम अटेंड करें द लॉ स्टूडेंट्स आर आल्सो देयर बाय नेचर ड्यूरिंग द मिड्स ऑफ द सेशन द स्टूडेंट्स स्टार्ट गोइंग आउट आउट ऑफ द हॉल्स दिक्कत यह है कि हमारे कुछ बार लीडर्स भी यही कर रहे हैं द स्पीकर्स यू नो the Honorable Judges of Supreme Court, the Chief Justices, the High Court Judges, Senior Advocates, the, our, our, our foreign leaders, they have come to address us. Hamare invitation po wo aaye hain, to hum unko thodi si ijjat yahi dhen, ki unka session attend kare, aur yeh mauka roj to milta nahi hai. Saal bhar to humko vakalat apni kar nahi hai. Do din ka samay, हिंदुस्तान के इतिहास में पहली बार एक इंटरनेशनल लॉयर्स कॉन्फ्रेंस हमने ऑर्गेनाइज किया है आपके बल पे और आपके लिए हमें यह दिखाना है और हमें यह साबित करना है कि हिंदुस्तान का वकील कितना यूनाइटेड है कितना उसके पास धैर्य है कितना पेशेंस है उसके पास और हिंदुस्तान का वकील जिस ढंग से नंबर में सबसे ज्यादा है ताकत में भी सबसे ज्यादा है आपकी संस्था है बार काउंसिल्स बार एसोसिएशंस बार काउंसिल ऑफ इंडिया आज आपने साबित किया कि हम बहुत ही मजबूत हैं प्रधानमंत्री जी ने भी कह दिया कि भाई ऐसी गैदरिंग हमने नहीं देखी थी तो ये आपकी बदौलत है मैं आप सबों को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूं हृदय से अब सेशन शुरू होने वाला है ऑनरेबल पैनलिस्ट ऑनरेबल जजेज आ रहे हैं मैं शर्मा जी को माइक देता हूं गुड आफ्टरनून लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन Uh, session 4, the subject is Alternate Dispute Resolution in International Transactions. Please welcome Honorable Justice Hima Kohli, Judge Supreme Court of India. She is to be the chair of this session. Please welcome Mr. Pramod Nair, Senior Advocate. Mr. Darius J. Khambata, Senior Advocate, Mr. Rakesh Khanna, Senior Advocate, Mr. Samuel Townend, Chief Elect Bar Council of England and Wales, and Senior Advocate C. U. Singh. So, friends, uh, we are uh, going to start the session. And as you know, it's a very, very crucial, very critical topic, alternate dispute uh, resolution in international transactions. And we are very fortunate to have with us very knowledgeable, experienced, and enlightened uh, legal luminaries from India and abroad. Mr. Samuel Townend is there, and they are going to shed a light on the on this subject of great importance and great interest. So the session is only for 75 minutes duration. So without uh, taking any further time for any formality, I will first uh, request Mr. Manoj Kumar, uh, member Bar Council of India, uh, to present a bouquet, shawl, and memento to Honorable Justice Hima Kohli. Mr. Manoj Kumar. Hold on. 
Mr. Manoj Kumar to present a bouquet shawl and moment to Mr. Samuel Townend, our foreign guest. He is chief uh, chair elect Bar Council of England and Wales. Manoj Kumar, please come. Mr. Pratap Singh. I now request Mr. Pratap Singh, member Bar Council of India for, from Punjab and Haryana to present a memento shawl and bouquet to Honorable Justice Hima Kohli, Judge Supreme Court of India, who is going to chair this session. Mr. Sadashiv Reddy, please come. Please come. Mr. Sadashiv Reddy, our uh, member from uh, Karnataka, he will present a book, a shawl, and memento to uh, senior advocate Darius J. Khambata ji. Pratap Singh, please come and present a bouquet shawl and memento to Shri Pramod Nayak. Vishwajit. Mr. Vishwajit Mishra, please come. Vishwajit Mishra, Advocate Patna High Court, please uh, present a memento shawl and bouquet to Shri Rakesh Khanna, Senior Advocate. Uh, Pratap Singh, please present a memento shawl and bouquet to Senior Advocate Shri C.U. Singh. Manoj Kumar ji, please present a bouquet shawl and memento to Shri Rakesh Khanna. And now I have the honor to request the uh, chair of this session, Honorable Justice Hima Kohli, to take over and uh, take forward this session. Justice Hima Kohli. Very good afternoon to all of you. I'm really delighted to be part of this remarkable event, a joint initiative between the Bar Council of India, the Law Society of England and Wales, and the Bar Council of England and Wales, with an aim to engage legal numeraries across the world to deliberate on the topics that impact the global legal fraternity. This is indeed a momentous occasion. The topic of the session, as you all know, is alternate dispute resolution in international transactions. While we will engage you all in this subject, 
and uh, divide it amongst us to give you a flavor of what our view is. We also have a tremendous task of keeping all of you awake and active after a sumptuous lunch. And we hope we live up to that too. It is indeed a pleasure to introduce you to the panelists of this session, Mr. Samuel Townend Casey, Chair-Elect, Bar Council of England and Wales, Mr. Darius Kambata, Senior Advocate, Mr. Siu Singh, Senior Advocate, Mr. Rakesh Khanna, Senior Advocate, and Mr. Pramod Nair, Senior Advocate. They will, of course, share their perspective on the subject. In today's world, everything is moving fast due to globalization. This has led to an increase in commercial transactions with businesses crossing cultural and geographical boundaries. It has also thrown up a variety of legal challenges. International trade and investments have grown phenomenally, making dispute resolution more complex. These disputes not only affect the parties involved, but also the global community at large. To address these challenges, ADR has emerged as a powerful tool for businesses. In the inaugural session, you would have noticed that most of uh, the speakers, starting from Honorable the Prime Minister to the Minister of Law, emphasized how important ADR is in today's scenario, where transactions are taking place globally, where the economy of the countries uh, is high at stake, where resolution of disputes is critical to the businesses. So the hallmark of ADR is flexibility, efficiency, adaptability, and making it valuable for navigating the complexities of the global trade. Drawing from its rich heritage of consensus-based conflict resolution, our country embraces a diverse range of ADR mechanisms, from the time-honored panchayats and the lokadalits to the cutting edge approaches like arbitration and mediation, as also the initiative and innovative hybrids such as Merab, Arb, Merab, the nation is weaving a seamless integration of tradition and modernity. It's paramount to fortify arbitration's position, ensuring that it is not only parallels, but also resonates prominently within the global legal framework. Interestingly, the Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act and UK's Arbitration Act were enacted contemporaneously in the year 2016. Both underscore party autonomy, minimal judicial interference, and finality of arbitration awards, epitomizing the very bedrock of modern arbitration jurisprudence. In recent years, India has made significant strides in establishing itself as a reliable, and trustworthy partner in arbitration and mediation services. No doubt there have been some hiccups on the way and we will all admit it, but the judiciary's unwavering commitment to providing finality to arbitration awards and fostering a pro-enforcement regime will give a fillip to India's transformation into a hub of international arbitration. Ad hoc arbitration in our country is well esconed at the same time there has been a steady acceptance of institutional arbitration too. <coughs> Excuse me. This upsurge of institutional arbitration in India requires fostering of a specialized arbitration bar. A bar composed of experts and legal practitioners solely engaged in arbitration would have to collaborate closely with established arbitral institutions. This symbiosis would not only streamline the arbitration process, but also demonstrate the viability of arbitration as a primary form of dispute resolution. Such a focused approach will go a long way in elevating the arbitration landscape, positioning it as an equal, if not a superior alternative to traditional court litigation. A specialized arbitration bar will attract fresh talent it will also promote a cultural shift within the legal community, positioning arbitration as a niche field for expertise. Regular workshops, training sessions, and interaction on different platforms like the present one 
hosted by the Bar Council of India, will help streamline every facet of arbitration process from the stage of drafting to enforcement, thus boosting domestic and international confidence in India as an arbitration hub. Touching briefly on the judicial precedents emphasizing finality and pro-enforcement approach, which of course my our panelists will uh, go in depth with, the Indian judiciary's approach towards preserving the integrity of the arbitral awards and respecting party autonomy is reflected in numerous landmark judgments of the Supreme Court and the High Courts. The increasing approach of courts across India is to refrain from acting as appellate bodies, delving into the merits of the award unless and until there are compelling circumstances as prescribed by law. The notable case of Balco distinctly em em exemplifies this with the Supreme Court sign signaling a robust pro-enforcement stance, there thereby conveying a message to the local global business community that India is committed to the sanctity of the arbitral process, culminating in an award. Through the decision in the case of uh, Vijay Karya, the Supreme Court has underscored the importance of giving due regard to party autonomy in the arbitration process. In the Amazon case, the Supreme Court has held that interim award passed by an emergency arbitrator is enforceable and observed that there was nothing in the act to prohibit the contracting parties from agreeing to a provision that provided for an award to be made by an emergency arbitrator. As recently as in April 23, in NN Global Mercantile case, a constitution bench of this court by majority had taken a view that an arbitration clause forming a part of an insufficiently stamped agreement cannot be acted upon. Conscious of the ripples it has created in the ADR circle, both domestically and abroad, as many believed that a more pro-arbitration stance would have been appropriate given the curable nature of the stamping defect, a five judges bench of this court headed by the Chief Justice has recently issued notice in a curative petition to have a relook at the issue. The point that I'm making is the response that the court is giving quickly to situations that can create encumbrances in completing an arbitration process from A to Z. By limiting judicial intervention, respecting party autonomy, and the finality of arbitration awards, courts in India have contributed in bolstering India's reputation as a favorable venue for dispute resolution. This judicial philosophy complements the legislative reforms and is a step in aid for our country to become a global hub for arbitration. Touching about mediation, an equally important tool in ADR, another essential tool that makes a, would make a world of a difference as it has been making even without a legislation. So through my journey on the judicial side, I have seen firsthand how mediation can be a powerful tool in helping parties find mutually beneficial solutions that can help avoid costly and protracted litigation. A watershed moment in India's legal landscape is the Medi Mediation Act of 2023. This legislation is not merely an act. It is a testament to our collective yearning for a more efficient, more harmonious, and less adversarial method of dispute resolution. It offers autonomy to the parties to resolve their differences creatively, thereby preserving relationships and saving both time and resources. While no single approach can be a panacea for all the legal challenges, this act is indeed a promising addition to our toolkit, encouraging dialogue over discord. The pre-litigation mediation mechanism contemplated in the act is significant. It enables parties to engage in a constructive dialogue even before a dispute reaches the doors of the court. By encouraging early engagement and dialogue, the pre-litigation mediation mechanism encapsulates the progressive spirit of India's evolving legal landscape. With a forward-leaning legislative architecture, a judiciary committed to arbitration enforcement and solid institutional underpinnings fortified by the rule of law, India is increasingly dismantling geographical boundaries through digital technology to facilitate online dispute resolution. To my mind, 
it is time for us to focus on harmonizing the Indian arbitration framework with global best practices. This will help consolidate its emerging stature in the international dispute resolution arena and send out a message to the global legal community and the stakeholders that we mean serious business. Now, I open the floor for my co-panelists to share their views, starting with <clears throat> Mr. Samuel Townend and followed by Mr. Various Kambata, Mr. C.U. Singh, Mr. Rakesh Khanna, and Pramod Nayar. Thank you. Namaskar. My name is Sam Townend KC. I'm Chair-Elect of the Bar Council of England and Wales. Can I first of all issue some thanks, please? Firstly, to the Honorable Miss Justice Hema Coley, uh, who leads a very distinguished panel to talk about the topic of international arbitration. I'm honored to be sharing the panel with them today. Can I also thank the Bar Council of India for hosting this amazing event. Uh, we hosted the Bar Council of India ourselves in London uh, in the summer and had a very productive series of sessions. Nothing I have to say on the scale of this event, but nevertheless, it is a great honor and a privilege to be able to um, return uh, just as they came to London. So uh, thank you also for inviting me to speak on this very important topic of alternative dispute resolution in international commercial transactions. And what I hope to do is to give an international perspective from my experience and, and that of the Bar of England and Wales. Uh, now, just to clear up one bit of confusion, first of all, the Bar Council, which I uh, represent, is, uh, represents uh, nearly 18,000 specialist advocates and senior advocates, including about 2,000 King's Council. The British system, as you may know, is different to the Indian system in that we have a split legal profession of solicitors who tend to be more client-facing, who handle client money uh, on the one hand, uh, represented by the Law Society of England and Wales, and my colleague Lubna Shuja is the president of the Law Society who spoke in the session before this and barristers, specialist advisors, and advocates on the other. International work is a staple for barristers in my jurisdiction. Some 13%, or 440 million pounds sterling per year, of the bar's income, just those 18,000 lawyers, is from exporting its specialist advice and advocacy services. That is in relation both to domestic seated London and UK seated international arbitration, as well as, of course, barristers going abroad to represent multinational companies in different jurisdictions. Surveys have repeatedly shown that London is currently uh, w one of the world's preferred centers for arbitration, and in 2021 alone, uh, just under 29,000 civil disputes were resolved through arbitration, mediation, and adjudication in the UK. So I myself am part of this. Uh, I'm a specialist advocate in the construction and energy field, and I act both domestically and internationally. And I've personally represented parties throughout the world, including in international arbitration and dispute adjudication boards in London, Australia, Singapore, Paris, and Dubai. I've also acted as mediation advocate and mediator in the UK and abroad, including in Abu Dhabi general markets. I, I'm, not, I'm raising that not to uh, pat myself on the back, but just to give you an example of what uh, a, a, a fully open uh, a practice as a lawyer does indeed look like. And many of my colleagues, including those on the panel, also share that experience. Uh, and from that experience, I can tell you that working with against and before advocates and tribunals from differing legal backgrounds is both professionally fulfilling and culturally enriching. It adds real quality to professional life. So both as a representative of the English Bar 
and personally, I'm therefore delighted to be invited to speak about this topic. <clears throat> Arbitration in relation to disputes between international parties can be highly desirable. It allows for the agreed appointment of a neutral specialist tribunal at a neutral venue. The procedure is private and confidential. There's no washing of dirty laundry in public, as would have to be the case in our open courts systems. Importantly, it allows for flexibility of procedure and speed that may be regarded as uh, more commercial than court-based procedures. Uh, to give one example of FIDIC contract dispute resolution processes, this is a standard form of contract in international infrastructure projects. These provide for dispute adjudication boards or arbitration boards that resolve disputes using a speedy process with clear steps in the case procedure and leading to a determination within three months of commencement. Multinational parties, including many of those from and with headquarters here in India, with very substantial commercial and other disputes, like and expect the flexibility, autonomy, and control that international alternative dispute resolution processes allow to them. Now, I believe that India is brilliantly placed to capitalize on this, and it has many great advantages uh, to become just uh, uh, as significant a center for international arbitration as any other. First, you have the ever adaptable common law system shared with my jurisdiction, England and Wales, but it's also used in 27% of the world's 340 jurisdictions. Secondly, of course, you use English alongside other Indian languages, which is the language of 80% of the world's international commercial transactions. Thirdly, you have a cohort of excellent, experienced domestic senior advocates, as seen by the recent phenomenon of established Indian senior advocates joining London chambers to practice international arbitration and occasionally in court to complement their India-based practices and I have in mind members of our panel here, but also Harish Salver Kesi, Guru Banerjee, Ratan K. Singh, Sharon Jagtiani, and Amit Sibyl, just to name but a few, and there are many more. Fourthly, you have a massive body of talented junior lawyers keen to be involved in international dispute resolution work and hungry to learn and experience. So in order to capitalize on these natural advantages, the jurisdiction can make it as easy as possible for international companies, both domestic and international, to resolve their disputes in India. These international companies, including many Indian companies that have a strong presence in the UK, such as Tata, are used to having complete freedom of choice as to who they have to advise them and to represent them in dispute resolution processes. It is a fact that some are put off by historic restrictions in India and choose to use London, Singapore, Hong Kong, or elsewhere as their forum for their arbitration and other dispute resolution processes. The BCI has shown great leadership in publishing rules permitting the possibility of foreign lawyers to practice in India and also for entering the inaugural Memorandum of Understanding with my Bar Council and with the Law Society of England and Wales, which addresses how we can intensify and expand that relationship between our respective jurisdictions and the lawyers who work in them. But there is more that can be done. The Bar Council would like to see the BCI regulations loosened in one respect, so that individual foreign advocates who are not intending to establish permanently in India, but simply wish to act on a case-by-case -case basis, on a fly-in, fly-out basis, do not have to go through the full rigmarole of registration and the complexity, time, and cost that entails. Speaking frankly, the proposed registration process at the moment, is, as drafted, is practically speaking uncommercial for individual barristers and key KCs 
who simply wish to act in the occasional international arbitration here in India. We would wish to see, this is my bar council, uh, as for Indian lawyers in London, and therefore on a fully reciprocal basis, that individual lawyers could simply fly in to act for the international or domestic party in India in non-court-based, I'm not talking about court, only ADR, non-court-based dispute resolution processes such as Indian seated uh, international arbitration without the need for registration. In saying this, I want to stress absolutely the Bar Council of England and Wales is not interested in competing with Indian law firms for their clients. As we do the world over, we simply want to be able to work with Indian lawyers to help them help their clients in domestic seated international arbitrations and other alternative dispute resolution processes. As the Bar Council of India rightly says in its objects and reasons in the March 2023 draft regulations, time has come to take a call on the issue. The opening up of law practice in India to foreign lawyers in the field of practice of foreign law, diverse international legal issues in international arbitration cases would go a long way in helping the legal profession grow in India to the benefit of lawyers in India too. I respectfully agree. I firmly believe that by sharing part of the international arbitration pie here in India, that pie will grow far more quickly and Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore and other cities will achieve their full potential as centers of international arbitration to the benefit of all those who practice in the area here and from abroad. Working together, I think we can truly achieve Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, one earth, one family, one future. Thank you for listening. So, thank you so much, Samuel. That was wonderful. And uh, may I request Mr. Kambata to take the floor and address us, please. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Kohli. It's an honor and privilege to be part of a panel chaired by you and with such a distinguished set of colleagues. Uh, I can't but start by thanking the Bar Council of India and all the state Bar Councils for the tremendous show that they have put up here. This is really a fabulous conference and it's, it, <clears throat> it, it showpieces, I think, the best of India. As we all know, international arbitration is on a cusp in India. Because with a growing economy, inevitably comes growing commercial litigation. We are now the fifth largest, soon to be within the decade, the third largest economy in the world. And we need to look at a dispute resolution mechanism that can keep pace with that economy. Because there's bound to be an exponential increase in the number of commercial disputes that such a growing and large economy generates. Arbitration in India, as many of you know, has very ancient roots. It's referred to even in the Upanishads. And as our Prime Minister told us today, the system of Panchayati Raj is a very ancient and entrenched system. We also have Loka Dalats, which again we heard of this morning. But common law arbitration, where commercial disputes are resolved is, relatively speaking, a recent occurrence, and it really only took place after the economic revolution of 1991. The 96 Act, I think, was born of a realization that courts in India were and would continue to be overburdened with massive social, administrative, and other litigations. And they would not find the resources nor, nor the time to actually give speedy commercial dispute resolution. The 96 Act was based largely on the unicentral model law. And it restricted challenge of awards. It 
provided the same standard for challenges awards in India, seated in India, whether they were between entirely Indian parties or they involved one foreign or non-resident parties and were called International Commercial Arbitration Awards. But as we know, the experience with this act to start with was checkered. We had enunciations of the law that gave a very broad view to the ground of challenge of public policy. The concept of a patent illegality came in. There was also a whittling down of the concept of competence competence, which is where the arbitral tribunal can decide its own jurisdiction. And for gateway disputes, the Supreme Court held that there was a fair amount a court could decide even before the tribunal was appointed. That led in 2015 to a slew of transformative amendments that were introduced on the initiative of this government. The government set its sights high. It wanted to facilitate quick enforcement of contract, easy recovery of monetary claims, award of just compensation by damages, and coupled with all of this was a general hastening of the dispute resolution process so as to encourage investment and economic activity. I think these amendments have had their role to play in the fact that as we were told this morning by the Solicitor General, we have now gone up to item 79 in the ease of doing business ratings, and I presume that is only a trend that will take us higher and higher. The 2015 amendments marked a conceptual change. One of the most important things they brought in was a dualistic structure, whereby international commercial arbitration was ring-fenced. The ground of challenge was restricted to public policy, and that was then defined exhaustively to be a very narrow public policy. Domestic awards between purely Indian parties were challengeable not only on that narrow ground, but also on the ground of patent illegality, with some safeguards about not reappreciating evidence. International commercial arbitrations are also given a fillip by allowing the parties to them to choose any substantive law, not necessarily only Indian law. And under Section 1112, only the Supreme Court can appoint arbitrators when you come to international commercial arbitration. The other thing that the 2015 amendments did was to incorporate into our law as statute the famous IBA rules on conflict of interest. So the red, orange, and green lists have actually been made part of our statute. And I think we are the only country in the world that has done this. And it's a step forward because they very clearly enumerate guidelines for disclosures by arbitrators, conflicts of interest, tests for impartiality and independence, and also for disqualification. The third thing that those amendments did was to strengthen negative competence competence. We already had statutorily the concept of positive competence competence introduced by way of Section 16. But now, Section 8 was strengthened to say that if you filed a matter in court, which was the subject matter of an arbitration agreement, all the court had to do was prima facie be satisfied that there was an arbitration agreement. Once that happened, it didn't actually decide the existence. It sent the matter to arbitration. And this, I believe, was a consequence of a judgment of the Supreme Court, which had held the same as regards foreign arbitrations. Section 17.2 also gave automatic enforceability to the interlocutory orders made by arbitral tribunals, gave them the force that courts, that orders of courts have. All this put together and more made our act a very effective one, particularly for international commercial arbitration. And at the same time, the Supreme Court was advancing the boundaries. Justice Coley mentioned several leading judgments. And the, what the Supreme Court was did, as it is its role to do, it filled up the gaps, it interpreted the law, and advanced it to give a more pro-arbitration stance. So you had the group of companies doctrine in chlorocontrols, which is now being relooked at in Cox and Kings. You had the seat doctrine in Balco. 
You had the recognition of emergency arbitrator orders and awards in the Amazon case. You had a very detailed and academic judgment on competence, competence in several decisions in the Ayaswamy case, Booz Allen, and of course in Vidya Drolia. And in Vidya Drolia, for the first time, it was made clear that as far as gateway disputes were concerned, a court could have a second look. And of course, our courts have now started adopting emphatically a pro-enforcement approach, not only for awards made abroad, foreign awards, but also for awards in arbitration seated in India. What Justice Kohli said also it was very important. Our courts have become responsive, particularly the Supreme Court, to problem areas. And she gave the example, the recent example of NN Global. I think the Supreme Court particularly and certain high courts have been very conscious of the importance of arbitration as a true alternative dispute resolution, perhaps a parallel stream of resolution to our courts. It is trite that law follows business, but I believe even the reverse is true because these innovations make India attractive as an investment destination. A swifter and fairer and predictable dispute resolution process will attract investment. But let us not be sanguine. There are miles to go before we can say that India is one of the leading international seats for international arbitration. And before I get to what I think we should be looking at now, let me first enumerate our strengths, because all too often we forget these. Sam Townsend had a list, but here's mine. Firstly, our common law history, with reported judgments going back over 150 years from some of the high courts. And consequently, a pool of world-class former judges and practicing counsel who can make fine arbitrators. Secondly, an innovative and independent judiciary, increasingly supportive of arbitration, and innovative with now cutting edge judgments which flow from them, they are perhaps our greatest asset. The third is the second largest bar in the world, many of whom and all of you are skilled in trial action, evidence work, commercial law. There's increasingly good infrastructure and support. I don't only mean airports, hotels. I mean even arbitration centers. If any of you has visited the Delhi High Court Arbitration Center, you will be astounded at the facilities available there. Sixthly, our demographics. We have a very young and aspirational student and lawyers population with a large number of lady lawyers. There's some amazing talent out there and we have to feed that aspiration and hunger by giving them the system to work in and to shine in. Seventh, and this is often underestimated, we have a vibrant and institutional democracy. Never undervalue the importance of this to attracting not only foreign investment, but also for investment within India. This is a linchpin, because any investor, foreign or Indian, always wants the assurance that if something goes wrong, this is a responsive system, this is a fair and transparent system, and will give him substantive legal redress. The solicitor in the morning spoke of a system that can be trusted, I agree with him. Our judiciary enjoys unparalleled trust today, and that's the way it should continue because that's one of the strongest cards we have to attract foreign investment and to invigorate our economy and keep our growth rate going. Because as investments now stream out of China, a totalitarian system, Investors are going to be much more discriminating about where this investment now goes. But we can easily squander all these advantages. And any aspiration that we become an international arbitration hub will require constant monitoring and overhauling of our environment of arbitration in India. 
Many countries do this. Singapore constantly looks at its arbitration law. Every few months, they have meetings to see, has something gone wrong? Can we do better? Can we modify the law to nudge arbitration and to encourage it? I'm reminded of what Charles Darwin had said in his magnum opus, The Origin of Species. He told us, it is not the strongest of the species that survive nor the most intelligent, but the most adaptable to change. And we have to be adaptable to change. The Prime Minister today told us, rightly, that today's critical problems are global problems and issues. Their solutions will require global frameworks. And he's right particularly with the rapid realignment of economies post-COVID and the geopolitical realignments, there is need for us now to adapt to a globalized best practice. And just as today, because of the fly-in, fly-out judgment of the Supreme Court, foreign lawyers and arbitrators are free to come and practice in India, so must our Indian lawyers be free and confident enough <coughs> to practice, I'm sorry, abroad. Now, <clears throat> all reform stokes insecurity. We seem to forget the insecurity of Indian industrialists in the early 1990s. It's now a forgotten chapter, no one even remembers it. But yes, for a few years, there was great insecurity that the economic reforms were gonna put them out of business, but no, they were not put out of business. They grew, they expanded, they got into cutting edge business, and today they are amongst the leading businesses of the world. Similarly, we lawyers need to evolve. And I have a bit of a list here which I'm gonna quickly run through. We've now increasingly seen pro-enforcement biases in courts, no doubt, and the temptation to second guess an award is retreating. It's not completely gone, but it's retreating. But I think we lawyers need to now evolve a ethos of not wanting to challenge every award or every order that is made. It's very easy for us to say, what difference does it make? Challenge it, let's see later. But that can't be the approach because you're overburdening an already uh, system which is already crushed with the burden of litigation. And perhaps imposition of realistic costs on such unmeritorious filings will help ease the burden. Secondly, arbitration centers. I mean the physical infrastructure of centers like the Delhi High Court Center must be set up in all the major cities in India with real-time transcription, which is a real game changer in the way an arbitration proceeds. Thirdly, institutions. There are leading institutions now in India, but they must be nurtured, encouraged, and given their independence to compete not only against each other, but against foreign institutions because there's really space for all. And competition makes the product better for the consumer. Regular monitoring of the Arbitration Act, as I've said, but with a soft touch because heavy-handed regulation often doesn't work. It has the reverse reaction. Legal aid and third-party funding. These are areas which have not been looked at closely enough for arbitration. Third-party funding is nothing but a form of legal aid. It helps impecunious litigants with good claims to fight their claims, and it weeds out the unmeritorious claims. So third-party funding, which has never been prohibited in India, it's been allowed from 1876 because the laws of maintenance and champery don't apply as strictly here as they do in England, but there's no regulatory matrix that governs it, and there are many requirements disclosure, control, etc., which require a regulatory matrix. The other area which needs looking at is a change of approach in arbitrators. There is, I believe, a due process paranoia in most arbitral tribunals, which is unjustified because, as you know, allowing lawyers latitude is never a good idea. Lengthy cross-examination and arguments don't make for a fairer process. So we must be happy and willing and humble enough to absorb the best international practices, chess clock timing, sharing of time, red fern schedules, real-time transcription, hot tubbing of experts, 
written submissions in advance, no ambushing of our opponents, and yet export our best practices. For example, internationally, oral closing submissions, which we are so familiar and used to in Indian court, are not, are, are not things that are popular abroad. But I believe this cross-pollination between our lawyers and international lawyers will add value. And the engagement that the Chief Justice spoke about this, this morning will only add value. So I'll end with this. And I quote Gandhiji uh, in this, who said, I do not want my house to be walled up or my windows to be stuffed. I want all cultures to blow freely about my house, but I refuse to be swept off my feet by any. With that philosophy, I believe we can go forward and make India a successful seat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kambata. I would now request Mr. Siyu Singh to take the uh, podium. Uh, we know we are, we slipped over in the previous session, and we hope that we don't eat into the next one, so we'll keep it short and crisp, perhaps uh, making some time for some questions if possible. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Kohli. Thank you to the Bar Council of India for organizing this amazing convention. I'm, uh, because of the time availability, I'm going to model my uh, short talk on the shortest will ever made, which said, being of sound mind and body, I've spent it all. Basically, uh, Darius and I had a word, so I decided, I said I would confine myself to the recognition and enforcement of foreign awards in India, as he was covering a much wider swath. Now, we had, um, as he sort of hinted at, we had two lost decades from 1996 to 2015, when despite the, the um, very um, meaningful intention behind the 1996 Act, it didn't really translate into quick uh, results and outcomes when it came to enforcement of foreign awards, because the standards that tended to be applied were similar to those applied almost in appellate jurisdictions in India, not just with domestic awards, but in general appeals. After the 2015 amendment, um, I think the Supreme Court uh, decided to make up for that lost time and to make it very clear to the world that India, uh, in, that the Indian jurisprudence was leapfrogging and coming to a stage where foreign awards would genuinely be treated as a, a distinct class and that the New York Convention and the entire intention behind the New York Convention would be in reality and on the ground and in practice implemented. Now, very briefly, because I'm, uh, uh, you know, time is very limited, and I'm very anxious to hear uh, Rakesh Khanna and Prabodh Nair on mediation, which is so important now going forward. Uh, what the Supreme Court has done in a few landmark judgments, and I'll just very quickly highlight them, is that they have made it clear that the grounds for challenging foreign awards are going to be strictly confined to Section 48.1 and 48.2. 48.1 allows five grounds for parties to challenge, and 48.2 allows two grounds for the court to suo moto um, strike down um, an award, and that's basically on jurisdiction and arbitrability only. Um, so in Vijay Karya in 2020, in February 2020, the Supreme Court, and fortunately most of the judgments I'm referring to, practically all of them are three judge bench judgments, as you know, uh, when uh, two judge benches disagree with each other, they get referred to three judges, and these are all three judge bench judgments, so they are more or less impervious to, uh, uh, I mean, they're not likely to be um, overturned in a hurry. So in Vijay Karya, the Supreme Court made it clear that the 48.1 and 48.2 would not only be 
strictly interpreted, but a narrow interpretation would be given to the 48-1 grounds. It would be read narrowly, and it would not be an expansive or, or, a, or a, you know, a, a liberal sort of view. So a party challenging an award, a foreign award would have to very strictly come within those five grounds or the award would be implemented. Further, the Supreme Court made it very clear that though Section 50 allows the Supreme Court under 136 to virtually sit in second appeal, because under, un, un, in, as you know, in foreign awards, unlike domestic awards under Section 37, where there's an appeal against the Section 34 order, in the case of foreign awards, the appeal lies only if the court has declined to enforce it. If a court enforces, if a court says that 48, uh, Section 48 grounds have not been made out and the, uh, and the award is to be enforced, there is no appeal against that. But 136 is still preserved. So what the Supreme Court went on to say in Vijay Karya was that notwithstanding 136 being preserved, the court would appeal apply would approach the matter as if there is no second appeal and the court would be very reluctant to interfere if there is an enforcement of a foreign award by the by the court below then in government of india versus vedanta which came a, a little later in the same year the supreme court clarified with regard to limitation of, of uh, enforcement of foreign awards they said that limitation would be three years and not 12 years. It would be under Article 137 of the Schedule to the Limitation Act and not 136. But at the same time, they said the Section 5, that is the, the um, um, uh, where, where sufficient cause is shown for being unable to move within the limitation of three years, a court would still have that small residual uh, jurisdiction to enforce the foreign award. Then in Centro Trade Minerals, the Centro Trade, there were two stages here. 2017 and 2020. In 2017, the Supreme Court clarified the law because there were two judge benches which had taken varying views on a two-tier uh, arbitral uh, um, agreement. This is basically on party autonomy. There are jurisdictions where you can have, a within the arbitration agreement itself, you can have a two-tier thing that if the, if, a, if the party is dissatisfied with the result of the arbitration, there can be a second layer like an appellate arbitrator virtually. And that had been struck down by an earlier bench of the Supreme Court. Central Trade, the, the three judge bench said no. This is since party autonomy is supreme, uh, and especially so in international arbitration, India would recognize that too. So a two tier arbitration would be permissible. Uh, in the second, in, in the last uh, Central Trade, that was uh, Central Trade three or four virtually, in 2020, the Supreme Court went on to say that. If, uh, uh, that even the, uh, the aspects like a party being unable to present its case, the one of the narrow grounds under Section 48.1, that would be read only in cases where a party could show two things. One, that, not with, that, uh, that there was no role of the party itself in being unable to present its case. In other words, it is unable to present its case uh, for factors which are completely beyond its own control. Two, very importantly, the Supreme Court said that this alleged violation of natural justice or being unable to present your case, you would have to prove that prejudice was, would be caused to you. In other words, you would have to show the court a second stage that, that had you been able to present your case, you could have materially affected the outcome. And not just a technical thing that you were, you were prevented from, uh, uh, from presenting your case. And um, lastly, um, there, there, there are a few uh, 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 judgments which have taken, uh, which have sort of clarified the law on, on foreign currency conversion, for instance. Well, Forasol was the 1984 judgment which had held the field, and that was again clarified recently in 2018 in Minakshi Saxena. And uh, um, saying basically that if a contract provided the date of conversion of foreign currency, then that would be the primary date. If not, the Forasol principles would apply. There were three. Uh, descending uh, factors to be taken into account. With all these judgments, and there are uh, no doubt some more on uh, various uh, uh, peripheral issues, I think the Supreme Court in a short space of four, three or four years has uh, made it very, very clear that India is a destiny, is, is a, a jurisdiction which is going to ensure that foreign awards are implemented and enforced, unless 
they come within that very, very narrow area where they can be challenged. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for keeping to the timeline. Really sharp, wasn't that, Mr. Singh? He could, couldn't have made it more sharper than that. And uh, I think we will catch up on the time, perhaps, that we have lost in the process of uh, expounding on some aspects which were very important, which Mr. Kambada did. Just for your information, we decided to split our uh, panelists on subjects so that there is no overlap. So you've heard all about arbitration. And now comes mediation with just Mr. Khanna uh, taking the, over the podium and telling us about his perspective of mediation, followed by Mr. Pramod Nair, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Kohli, uh, my fellow panelists from the dais, my dear brothers and sisters. Mediation today is becoming one of the most important mechanisms in dispute resolution system. I would like to begin by quoting Justice Louis T. Brandes of the Supreme Court of USA, who in 1912 said, the old idea of good bargain was the transaction in which one man got better of another. The new idea of good contract is a transaction which is good for both the parties. I believe that sentiment truly and oppositely echoes the ethos of modern dispute resolution and in the commercial transactions today. Pro tanto, it would be germane to note that Archibald Cox, in 31st, the 31st Solicitor General of USA, believed that through, cent through centuries, men of law have been persistently concerned with the resolution of dispute in ways that enable the society to achieve its goals with the minimum force and maximum of reasons. And I earnestly am of the resolute opinion that proper implementation of mediation, both domestically and internationally, has always been elusive answer. From time immemorial, the importance of mediation and reconciliation has been recognized by Indian society. Various texts like Kautalya's Arthashastra, Balmiki's Ramayana, have spoken about the effectiveness of the dispute resolution process through mediation. The efforts made by Lord Krishna to resolve the dispute between the Pandvas and Korvas through various negotiation techniques also finds mention in the epic of Mahabharata. Notably, it was this failure of Lord Krishna and ever that led to legendary war between Pandvas and Korvas. Furthermore, the dispute resolution carried out by Panch Parmeshwars through mediation and negotiation has also been recorded as potent method for bringing an end to the conflicts in India. It is only upon the failure of mediation and negotiation that Panchas proceeded to adjudicate the matters. In the year 1999, in India, we introduced Section 89 in our Civil Procedure Code, thereby formally adopting mediation as one of the alternate dispute resolution mechanisms. And very recently, in August this year, we promulgated our very own Mediation Act which also defines and deals with the medi international mediations. This further envisions India's commitment to amicably, amicably resolve disputes through the mechanism of mediation. Consequently, as you all have already discerned by now, I'll be discussing mediation in general, and my friend Pramodji will be discussing the legislations. Friends, International commercial transactions tend to be high-value cases with considerable level of complexities that innately are more time and cost consuming than domestic disputes. Thus, naturally, adversarial litigation local to one party, ipso facto, is generally less appealing and palatable due to its underlying presupposition of inherent bias against the foreign party, as well as its characteristically lengthy and expensive nature. Needless to therefore say that litigation is not the panacea it was perceived to be, and over-reliance thereon 
can actually be detrimental to the cause of justice. It would be pertinent to note that the law of instrument, otherwise known as Maslow's hammer, is, cognitive, is a cognitive bias that involves an over-reliance on the familiar tool. As Abraham Maslow said in 1966, and I quote him, I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. It is therefore critical to understand that resorting to the litigation at every instance is not apposite and the same may not always yield the peaceful quietus to the discord at hand for in the prudent words of Doffy Thomas, peace is not the absence of conflict but the presence of creative alternative for responding to the conflict. Similarly, despite arbitration indubitably being the most preferred alternative for resolving the international commercial disputes today due to the huge degree of autonomy and flexibility it facilitates over the courts administered litigation. It is also plagued with similar concern of exorbitant costs, slow progress, and placing exaggerated emphasis on the form over the substance, all while still being very much adversarial in nature. Besides, enforcement still remains major challenge. A dream, lawyers must embarrass the reality that the officers of the court and the social engineers of their communities, their residentry cannot be defined by litigation or arbitration alone. To that effect, Abraham Lincoln had aptly declared, and I quote, discourage litigation, persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. Point out to them how the nominal winner is often a real loser in fees and expenses and waste of time. A peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man. There will still be business enough. Even the great Mahatma Gandhi, our father of nation, famously in his famously titled story of my experiments with truth, has sagaciously stated, and I quote, I realize that the true function of a lawyer is to unite parties riven as under. The lesson was indelibly burned into me that the large part of my time during the 20 years of my practice as a lawyer was occupied by bringing about private compromises of cases. I lost nothing thereby. Not even of money, certainly not my soul. It is this ambivalent and vacillating landscape that we may now again prudently reminisce, reconnect and resonate with the saying that an ounce of mediation is worth a pound of arbitration and ton of litigation. Friends, mediation is the only non-adjudicatory, voluntary, party-centered and structured negotiation process where the neutral third party, that's a mediator, assists the feuding parties in amicably resolving their disputes by using specialized communication and negotiation skills and techniques to help them realize what they want and why, what they will give to get it, what they, will, what they think the other side wants and why, what they think the other side will give to get it, and the risk to themselves and the other side of not reaching the settlement, which greatly increases the chances of a successful settlement and permanent resolution of entire dispute. As already endeavored, Earlier, the parties participating in adversarial disputes resolution process necessarily have to partake in lengthy, costly, complicated, and time-consuming process that includes exchanging of pleadings, framing of issues, reading of documentary and oral evidence, lengthy cross-examination of witnesses, advancing arguments, and then finally adjudicating the dispute at the end of which the party is normally the winner 
and the other one is the loser. On the other hand, the value of mediation as an effective tool for the dispute resolution can be clearly evinced from the wide array of unique features clustered in its rubric. The features include severability, flexibility, party participation, consensus, self-reflection, preservation of the ongoing relationship and or peaceful termination of relationship, etc. Further, it fosters the peaceable and healthier interpersonal interactions in the long term, thereby preempting the cause of conflict in the society. Although it would therefore seem that nothing prevents mediation from cementing its place as a premier alternate, alternative dispute resolution process for the resolution of disputes, Amen, the international transaction, the lack of popularity, ratified international legislative framework, such as that of international commercial arbitration, severely seems to limit its same, limit the same. The parties to such disputes want to assume that once they achieve the settlement of their conflict, it ought to be easily enforced. Otherwise, they would be paradoxically find themselves back in the same position as they started out with, substantiating the well-known psychological pattern known as the prisoner's dilemma. Although international efforts like 2008 EU directives on mediation and Singapore Convention make significant strides towards the satiating such concerns, they still lack popular support and ratification of the member countries. That said, the mediation still remains a cost-effective tool that provides increased access to justice while elevating the burden of the overcrowded court system. Presently, the comprehensive studies have found that even the low success rate of mediation frees significant resorts and litigation costs of the government, business, and the citizen provide for significantly more efficient break-even points. In conclusion, I believe that it is time for all stakeholders of our justice delivery system to proactively promote the mediation in new as well as the pending disputes and also to ratify international legislative framework so as to make mediation as the last fog, as vogue as arbitration and litigation in the sphere of international commercial transactions. For the Victor Hugo has famously said Nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. I further humbly, firmly believe that propelling the mediation as a mainstream dispute resolution mechanism, both domestically and internationally, has now become desideratum. And this may, in turn, hold the key of offering the greater access to speedy and better qualifying quality of justice to a larger section of global gentry in today's age of globalization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Khanna, for expounding on mediation. We have another and the final speaker on the panel, uh, Mr. Pramod Nair, senior advocate, who's also going to address us on aspects relating to mediation. Mr. Nair. Thank you, Justice Kohli. It's um, really a privilege to be here in the company of uh, such distinguished co-panelists. And my thanks to the Bar Council of India and the various uh, Bar Councils who've turned up to make this such a spectacular conference. Uh, building on the foundation of what uh, Rakesh had dwelt upon, what I propose to do in the 10 minutes that I have is to provide you with the landscape, the contractual landscape and the domestic and the international landscape within which the process of mediation functions. But, but before that, let me just take one step back and ask you to reconsider the, the topic uh, that we have for the session today, which is alternative dispute resolution in international transactions. And in particular query, whether the expression alternate is still well suited to mediation and arbitration. Why do I say that? Well, there have been studies in the domestic context which have uh, shown that eight out of 10 commercial contracts now have an arbitration uh, and or mediation clause. 
And if you look at that statistic, I think it's quite staggering, which basically means that around 80% of domestic commercial contracts now have an arbitration or mediation clause. And in the international context, if anything, that number would only be higher. Now, what does that mean? That certainly means that arbitration and mediation today are no longer alternate modes of dispute resolution. When it comes to commercial transactions, they are pretty much the mainstream modes of dispute resolution. We don't have the time to uh, dwell into the reasons for it, but that is the reality of uh, international commerce today. So in terms of how parties go to mediation, the first is, of course, the contractual route. In contract drafting today, what we see quite uh, definitively is a preference for what are called as multi-tiered dispute resolution clauses, where parties explore a succession of options to try and resolve a dispute that has arisen amongst themselves. The first would typically be the process of mutual negotiations. The second would be a process of mediation with the assistance of a trusted intermediary like the mediator. And it is only failing the first two avenues of dispute resolution that parties contractually agree to invest either an arbitral tribunal or a chosen court with their dispute to resolve. And therefore, what this shows is that there is a clear and distinct preference for parties to commercial transactions, both domestic and international, to embrace mediation in an attempt to resolve disputes quickly, at the least possible expense, and with the least disruption to the commercial relationship that exists between the parties. This contractual preference for mediation is increasingly being given a fillip by legislations, by international conventions, and judge-made law. And let me just sketch that landscape very quickly for you. The first and probably the biggest event in recent times, and I would say the game changer for mediation, has been the adoption of the Singapore Convention on Mediation, which provides an excellent framework for the recognition and enforcement of mediated settlement agreements. The convention has seen more than 50 states across the world sign up to it and has recently entered into force after receiving the minimum number of ratifications for this to happen. In the same way that the New York Convention allows an arbitral award to flow freely across national boundaries and be treated by 165 states as being a final award rendered by their highest court, a mediated settlement agreement pretty much has the same status today thanks to the Singapore Convention on Mediation. So therefore, mediation, which was considered a viable option only after the commencement of arbitration or court proceedings to enforce a mediated settlement, uh, now finds itself in a position where a mediated settlement agreement could be incorporated in the arbitral award or judgment to ensure ease of enforcement. Now, supplementing the Singapore Convention in the Indian context is the new Mediation Act, which entered into force, in fact, earlier this week. It gives teeth to a mediated settlement, which can directly be enforced as a judgment or a decree of a court. Now, one important uh, characteristic of this legislation is that it applies only to mediated settlements arising out of mediations which happen in India. Uh, that may be perceived as a shortcoming, but I'm sure that it is not going to be long before the Mediation Act is amended to also provide for mediated settlement agreements uh, arising out of mediations conducted outside India to also be given the same status. And I think that will happen as a consequence of India ratifying the Singapore Convention and then incorporating legislation in India to transform that national, international convention into national law. There are also a number, uh, before that, before going to the other statutes which deal with mediation, I think what was particularly noteworthy about the Mediation Act was not only the content of the act, but also the process of lawmaking. I don't think there has been any other legislation which has gone through such a wide degree of public consultation as the Mediation Act. There were consultations that were organized across the country 
views were taken amongst all the stakeholders. There were multiple iterations of the draft bill, and that all culminated into the enactment of the Mediation Act, and it's being brought into force earlier this week. And I think that augurs very well for public representation in national lawmaking. This new enactment that we have is the latest addition to the legislative landscape, which in recent times has provided a significant impetus to the mediation landscape in the country. The Companies Act, as many of you will know, encourages the use of mediation to resolve corporate disputes. The Consumer Protection Act encourages the use of mediation to resolve consumer disputes. And I think one of the most significant changes that was brought about in recent times was that brought about by the Commercial Courts Act of 2015, in which recourse to mediation is almost always a condition precedent for the filing of a commercial suit. And that has been given even greater teeth by judicial decision making, a recent judgment of the Supreme Court, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, held that when parties leapfrog the mediation process and take a commercial dispute straight away to courts, then the courts are duty bound to reject the plaint and dismiss the suit because of failure to take recourse to mandatory mediation. And I think that augurs very well for the future of the mediation process in the country. So uh, to conclude, I think uh, it's clear that Indian businesses and foreign businesses will certainly benefit from the fact that, India, that mediation has come of age in the Indian context. Uh, businesses will get quick and practical solutions through the mediation process. The burden on courts will also be reduced, and I think that has particular resonance in a country like India, where the current backlog of cases is around 47 million cases across various courts. And we can see green shoots of that change already happening. Uh, Darais made reference to the ease of doing business index. In 2014, India was ranked number 142 in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. Five years later, in 2019, it leapfrogged to 63 in terms of ease of doing business. And I'm sure when the next set of rankings are prepared in 2024, India would do much better than that. So to conclude, I think this underscores the importance of effective dispute resolution for national progress, and amongst all the options available, the role of ADR in particular is likely to be the most significant going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nair. Now, before I call uh, Mr. Manoj Kumar to propose the vote of thanks, I would request Mr. Rajesh Shukla, Vice Chairman, Jharkhand State Bar Council, he is very keen to present a bouquet to our uh, foreign guest, Mr. Samuel Townend. Mr. Shukla. And now Mr. Manoj Kumar to propose the vote of thanks. dignitaries on and off the dice, and my dear friends. With this, we are coming to the conclusion of an enlightening session on alternate dispute resolution in international transactions. On behalf of the Bar Council of India and all present here, I extend a warm gratitude to Honorable Mrs. Justice Hima Kohli, who chaired the session. Thank you very much, madam. I also extend warm gratitude to Mr. Samuel Torn, who is the Chair-Elect of Bar Council of England and Wales, who has come all the way to grace our program. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I'm also thankful to the senior advocates, Mr. Daris Kambate, Mr. C.U. Singh, Mr. Rakesh Khanna, and Mr. Pramod Nair, who had presented their views on the subject. Thank you very much, sir. La lastly, I thank each and every one of you who are present here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, please be seated.
please be seated our next and the last session of today that is artificial intelligence transforming the legal landscape the two honorable supreme court judges honorable mr justice p s narsimha ji he will chair the session it's a very interesting session honorable mr justice arvind kumar both have arrived in the hall and honorable mr justice rajiv sakdar judge high court delhi his lordship is also here so kindly the students the volunteers this session on artificial intelligence we are going to invite the honorable chair hmm? on the dais what is this this is a very important session